Isoquants are useful because they tell us a lot of information about trade-offs, okay? And they tell us if you want to uh, substitute one of the inputs for the other but still meet the same target, the shape of the isoquant gives you a lot of information about how to do that, okay? So let's suppose that we've got, as a concrete example, these colonists on an alien world. There's 100 colonists and they need to produce 100 units of food per day, one per person, okay? And let's assume that they're using a production technology with this shape, okay? And we've got capital on this axis and labor on this axis. Now I should say the choice to put L on the bottom and K on the top, that's arbitrary. I could have picked it the other way around. And if I did, you just switch everything, okay? There's no set rule about which one goes where. But anyway, this is how I'm drawing it today. Let's suppose that these guys are initially sitting out right here, and this is the amount of capital and labor that they've allocated to producing food. It's on this isoquant, it meets the target, everybody's gonna get fed, great. Now one of the colonists gets sick and can't work, okay? Suddenly we are down our, we're down on our labor, and so we fall off this isoquant down to here, okay? And this is gonna be at some point below this isoquant, so we're not going to make enough food for everyone to eat. Unless we can either switch another worker over from producing the other goods, say shelter in this economy, or we can switch some of the robots over. And let's say for whatever reason it's easier for these guys to switch the robot over. How many extra units of capital, how much extra machinery are they going to need to substitute for the loss of this worker? Well, the isoquant tells us that they basically need to, if they're going to have this much worker, they need to get up to here. And so this is the amount of extra K. So I do a little triangle K that's a symbol for the change in K that they need to stay on the same isoquant, okay? And you can see that they sort of, as drawn, it's like roughly one to one, right? You lose one worker, you get one extra robot. But it doesn't have to be that way. Suppose instead these guys were working way out over here where they had most of the laborers doing uh, farming and almost all the heavy machinery is not available for this task, okay? In that case, if you lose one worker, well, it's actually not that hard to replace them with machines. You're gonna end up, I'm trying to draw it really carefully here, and you just need to give them a tiny little, maybe an extra spade or something to keep the productivity of all the team up to the same point and producing the same amount of food. Conversely, these guys could be working with a production tech mix like over here, where there's a very small number of laborers, but they're using the machines really intensively. So it's like all automated farming, and they're there as computer programmers, overseers, fix-its, repair people, and you know, their job is really important. Each one of them is adding a lot of value because the robots are doing most of the work. In this case, if we lose one of these workers, we may not even have enough capital to get back on the curve, because it's literally off the chart here, okay? So in this case, uh, the amount of extra capital we would need over here is really large to replace a worker. In here, it's sort of a moderate amount, and if we're down in this corner, the amount of extra capital we need is uh, a tiny amount. And you can see that this is driven by this kind of curved shape of this isoquant. And what we do is we, we can formalize this concept in something called the marginal rate of technical substitution. And the marginal rate of technical substitution is, uh, the, is basically a measure of the trade-off of inputs to keep your outputs the same. If you lose one worker, how much extra capital do you need to produce the same amount? Conversely, if you lose one unit of capital, how, much, how many extra laborers do you need to make up that and produce the same amount, stay on the same isoquant? It's uh, technically, we can call this MRTS, and it can be defined as the slope of the isoquant. Now, the slope in this case is the partial derivative of K with respect to L, but that's only because I chose at the very beginning to draw K on the vertical axis and L on the horizontal. I could have gone the other way, in which case the marginal rate of technical substitution would be the partial derivative of L with respect to K. 
Now it turns out that the marginal rate of technical substitution is closely linked to two other concepts we've already discussed, okay? The marginal rate of technical substitution, if it's equal to, in this particular case, is equal to negative marginal product of labor divided by marginal product of capital. Why is that the case? Well, let's think about it step by step. First off, one reason it's negative is because the marginal product of labor is going to be positive in general. It's like if you add more labor, you get more output. And the marginal product of capital is also going to tend to be positive. So if you add more capital, you get more labor. And the marginal rate of technical substitution is the slope of this thing, so it's negative. So we do have to slap a negative sign in front of it. But why is it equal to these ratios of these marginal product of labor, marginal product of capital? And one way you can think about it is, remember, I'm interpreting it as if you give up one unit of labor, how much extra capital do you need, okay? So if you give up one unit of labor, how much food do you give up? Well, one unit of labor gives you whatever its marginal product of labor is, amount of food, okay? Okay, because that's what the marginal product of labor measures. So if you give up one unit of labor, you're gonna give up that amount of food. Here, let me get a little more space. If you give up one laborer, that means you give up one marginal product of labor of food. Okay, now we need to replace that, okay? How do we replace it? We need to gain uh, one marginal product of labor of food divided by MPK units of capital to make that up. Why is that the case? Well, if we gain one unit of capital, we obtain an extra marginal product of capital food, okay? But if instead of one unit of capital, we get only uh, one over the marginal product of capital units of capital, then that means we obtain an extra one unit of food. I'm just dividing both sides by MPK now. And if we gain MPL divided by MPK units of capital, well, that's going to obtain for us an extra MPL of food, an extra marginal product of labor of food. And that's just because now I've multiplied this last equation sort of by MPL. So this is my sort of intuitive explanation. And notice that if we gain this MPL divided by MPK units of capital, we obtain one extra MPL of food. And that is exactly how much we lost when we lost the worker, okay? So this thing is, this is sort of the underlying intuition for how the mar why the marginal rate of technical substitution has anything to do with these marginal products of capital and labor. Uh, there's one other mathematical explanation for why this is the case. You don't really need to know it for the course, but I'm going to explain it in the next video, so watch that if, if this has been unsatisfying to you.